Welcome to Black Man Lab. We are live Monday, March 22nd, and we are going to have another great conversation tonight uh, discussing the art of being a writer and or author. And, um, and then uh, the kind of the world around that as well. So we'll get into that shortly. But before we do, as always, we like to discuss um, what got us here and then do some housekeeping that we do every week as well. And before we get started with that, I want to introduce uh, my Black Man Lab brethren, uh, Joe Barker and of course, Freeze up. You're on mute, Molly. Yeah, it looks like it looks like Marty's freezing, y'all. All right, well we we it's your, we go. It's your fault, brother. <laughs> well, we we got we got we got some great guest guests in here tonight. So David, I know you have a whole lot to offer, man. So we're gonna lean heavy on you, brother. <laughs> But nah, glad to have you here, man. But yeah, we have my other co-host here, uh, brother attorney Davis, Molly Davis. And Molly, man, appreciate your, your support and all that you do here. And as one of the founders, just appreciate your vision. Um, Molly, you were in and out for us, with us for a second there, brother. So we, uh, we brought Mo Molly on in, man, for, for you there. Good, so go good. I, I don't know what happened there, man. My whole internet just dropped and then came back on, man. So I apologize gotcha. for that. No worries. So um, I don't know where we left off at, but every well, week we, I, we just did a quick intro, but you do your okay. thing. Okay. So every week we just kind of start out with um, what got us here and then some, some traditional stuff that we do every week as well. Well, to make sure that we're in the right frame of mind to take on this information. Um, first and foremost, uh, want to you introduce Molly as, as our founder um, and what, what, what we started maybe four years ago or so, Molly and Three other brothers uh, got together with their sons with the intention of them being able to get some information from brothers outside of themselves. As we know as, as fathers to sons, sometimes quite often our sons don't want to hear from us, but they'll listen to a uncle, a godfather, or a close friend. Um, they'll take the information in a little bit more readily. So that's what started. And then uh, we grew to a point of having over 250 Black men in the room together to share information about different things, whether it was something professional driven or something that was about self-development. So um, we are now in this, this uh, virtual space, which affords us the opportunity to bring in people from not just Atlanta, but around the country as well. And every week, one of the things that we do before we get started is make sure that we are centered. We are in a space that we are able to take on information. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask my brother, Joe Barker, to uh, help to get us centered. Joe? Sure, sure. Thank you, Brother Marty. So each week what we do is we just kind of try and enter space, and, and we have brothers that are going to, you know, bring in the ancestors and such. But in order to receive the information from these powerful guests and the speakers that we have, especially on a topic that's so critical tonight, authors and, and, and writers and and different, you know, creative spaces that they're in. You know, we, we really want to open this up to receive what they have. And so often we come into a Monday from, you know, going into a work week that we may not be looking forward to, going coming out a weekend that, you know, maybe we didn't ever want to leave the weekend. <laughs> we wanted to stay in it. So we enter into a, a, a space kind of with some chips on our shoulder already. So what we do is we just, want to be at peace. We want to get all of that out and just breathe in and receive in the positive energy that the brothers are going to be bringing in tonight. So very simply, what we do is we just take a couple of deep breaths together and we, we inhale the positive energy from ancestors that we know is going to be coming into the room and we exhale all of the negative thoughts, all the negative energy, all the things that will prevent us from being in the space where we can receive that. So what I ask for you all to do is join us now and just on the count of three, take a deep breath. One, two, three. Now let that out. Let that out. Let that out. Um, and, you know, we've had a couple other brothers that come in here and talk about how that's the, the spirit of life, the, the breathing in the spirit. Like, I love how so many of our brothers that are into the meditative space and such just kind of describe what this does for us and how it centers us. So with that, we're going to do one more. 
Just taking a deep breath. One, two, three. And let it out. And let's get ready to receive all this positive energy. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that, man. And hey, man, uh, I want you to lessen that count a little bit because I started getting a little lightheaded, man. You hold it too long, man. <laughs> so <laughs> I saw you, bro. I saw you. <laughs> but seriously though that that does a lot for the soul to be able to kind of breathe out all of that um the negative energy that, that especially on monday can bring you know we know that that, that can bring a lot of negative energy so helps us to be in the right frame of mind to be in taking taking on this this information uh brother maoli man i know you are here tonight as a panelist but you are also one of the very best at bringing in the ancestors. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, to give a libation if you could. So um, it's simple. We wouldn't be here without our ancestors. And so we start uh, the tradition of libations. And we've seen it done many, many different ways all over the world, over the African diaspora. We've seen brothers on the south side of Chicago and a little local park called um, Luella Park, point out a little old English. Um, but we've seen it done uh, with strong liquor um, on the continent and with water into plants. But it's just a calling of our ancestors, just an acknowledgement, just knowing that we, we remain connected with them. And so with that, we, we'd like for you to just raise your fists and do it in our Black Man Lab tradition. And this is for those ancestors who built civilizations, who came in Kemet and Nubia or along the Nile Valley, who were in the, uh, during our classical African civilizations, those three golden ages of uh, Songhai, of classical uh, Nubia, as well as classical Kemet. We say to all those nation civilization builders, Ashe. Ashe. Okay. And then those who uh, resisted when we, uh, when our ma'afa, our great uh, attack against our being as, as human African people began and those who would resist, whether it was in um, Brazil, whether it was in Jamaica, in Georgia, in Florida, all throughout the hemisphere, wherever African people were taken, we always gather to reform ourselves and reconstitute ourselves as an African people. And those that resisted, we say for them, Ashe. Ashe. And then those in these uh, yet to be United States on this soil that is the soil of our native brothers and sisters. And so we honor them and acknowledge that this is their land. Yet we uh, toil in this land and shed blood and tears uh, and sweat. And so we remember those uh, ancestors like Fannie Lou Hamer, those that share crop the land, and then those that fought so that we could secure our 40 acres in the mule that we will eventually secure. So we call on all those ancestors, Ashe. Ashe. And finally, for those that are yet to come, those that will someday watch this and say there were a group of serious-minded Black men who still believed and understood in the capacity of what was possible for uh, our community to build and grow and reestablish this identity as Quilombos and reestablish um, ourselves as an African people, a full, complete people. Um, we say for those yet unborn, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. I say oh. I say oh. All right. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. It's, it's, um, it's, it's of utmost importance that we have the level of understanding that we would not be here without those that came before us. So um, bringing them into this space is, is perfect and important because all we are trying to do is move the needle forward. Um, so with that, let's get started. We have a really good conversation tonight. Um, again, Brother Maoli is going to be on as, as, a, uh, as a panelist, given that he has recently written a book. Um, so I, I'm going to let him speak from that aspect. Uh, but before I get to him, 
our brother David Manuel, who's been on the Black Man Lab before, and, and we consider him a part of uh, the Black Man Lab. We would like him to come on and give it give an introduction, brother David, about you know who you are and how you got into the space as well. So, brother Manuel, you're on mute, bro. You're on mute, bro. There you go. There you go. Okay. Good. So first of all, again, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I, I'm so honored anytime I get a call or message from Mauli or any of you brothers to be part of this. This is family for me. So uh, I, I just want you guys to know how special this Black Man Lab is. Uh, with everything that we do in the community, I mean, it really circles back to pouring into our young kings. And this, this, this is it. And so anytime I get the call, I want to be there. I want to champion the cause and just want to be part of it. So uh, I got into this writing game uh, when I was an educator in Atlanta public school system many, many years ago. And I was a second grade educator at the school, Thomasville Heights Elementary School. And many of you guys know where Thomasville Heights is, is between Moreland and Boulevard and during the time where I was an educator back in the 80s, you know, you had the, the housing across the street. Uh, you had a, a lot of liquor stores. So these kids, every time they woke up, they passed through the housing, they passed through the liquor stores, and then right down the street is the federal pen, not the state pen, but the federal pen. And so that's what they saw every day along with, you know, the, the weekend violence and that kind of thing. And they came to classroom and it was our job to inspire them and educate. Well, after, you know, eight years of doing that and, and, and seeing so many young, beautiful faces, future kings and queens in my class, and then finding the absentee of the father in the household for whatever reason, I really drove me to say I wanted to uh, really focus on uh, the role of a father. And then when I started listening to all the media uh, with the negative talk about African-American fathers, it really bothered me because I kept hearing that, you know, black men don't pay child support, black men don't support their family. And I wanted to write a book that celebrated the real, the opposite of that, what strong black men will do for their family. And I wrote the book, I'm a Father. And... Uh, before I've given copies of it to all the youth. So if you guys got new kids involved, I want to make sure they get a copy in their hand. Uh, it's all positive stories told through the eyes of the children celebrating their fathers. So it's one thing for me or you guys to say we're a great father. It's a bigger thing for our kids to say that and the kids in the neighborhood because that's what it's all about. And so that got me really into writing. That's awesome. That's awesome. We're going to take, take you up on grabbing some of those books, brother, because we, we we are trying to always put something in our young folks' hands, man. So really appreciate that. Just let me know. I'll drop off a couple of cases, three, four, five. You just let me know the number. Man, love that. Yeah. Our young, our love young. Yeah, we, um, we got some people that. Our young right creators. Now. Yeah. Go ahead, that's Bob. great. I was just saying our young creators. And what's interesting is there some intersection with what Brother David described and what you know I talk about in my book? I talk about the Thomasville area in in the book because um, I'll never forget when I was an officer in the Navy, I was coming off the base to go into that area. They had what was then called a weed and seed program. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, right? And yeah. so they would have military folks come over and serve as mentors. So I got assigned a mentor and I would come over and they, and I talk about that experience, right? Because I, I, I like you, David, I agree the, the, the ever presence of the federal pen, mm. right? Waking right. up and going to sleep to that. It just seems so heavy, you know? And um, it, I, I just, it, it, you know, it was, it was ingrained on my mind of how, you know, these young people must see and view and move, you know, with that as their backdrop. Their, I call it in the book, it was their 
um, their sun and their moon. It was what they went to sleep to and what they woke up to. Um, but I was grateful that there were brothers like um, a chief sheets who um, just kept bringing us there. And we, I didn't know his motivation until later that his own son had been murdered. And so his position was, um, I have to do more to give more love and support so that these young people don't feel like they need to take, throw their life away mm -hmm. or take another life. And that was just profound. So I appreciate, you know, that's a connectivity that we have. I coached AAU ball over there as well. Uh, right. My first AAU team was out of, uh, we, were, we, were, we were going to, and practice, but the rec center was closed at the time. So we were practicing in the elementary school um, right there across the street from the rec center. So, oh, you wow. know, um, I think our experiences inspire and inform us as, as writers. And I, I've written for years um, poetry when I, when I was at the Naval Academy, just trying to express myself. But this book, um, the We Need You book, is really an outgrowth of dealing with young black men, my sons and their friends, yeah. and wanting to give them some direction. And so I think, you know, I don't, I didn't write it because I saw myself, you know, transitioning out of the law, you know, and, and David, I, I'm sure maybe the same for you. It wasn't that I wrote it because I felt like there was a need for it the way David felt like there was a need to tell the story mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. fathers. And so um, I write out a necessity and, and I'm grateful um, to, to have that, that luxury, you know, to be able to write out of necessity to speak what I believe are truths that haven't been spoken um, within our community. And, and so, let, me, let me add. Oh, go ahead, David. Let me add some real quick to that. As Mauli was speaking, during that time in the '80s and early '90s, Thomasville Heights Elementary School, there was an article in the AJC just to paint a picture of that environment. There was an article in AJC that said more people were killed in a four-mile radius of Thomasville Heights than any worse area in Compton or mm. in any worse area in New York. And so when you think about it, some of the kids that I taught were falling asleep in class yeah. in second grade. And I would ask them, why are you not up? And they was like, cause there was gunshots and we were sleeping on the bed. This was a daily activity for them. So it was at one point considered like a war zone, uh, mm -hmm. the area that Maoli was talking about. So you're right. Uh, I, I wrote this book because there was a need to share some positivity when it comes to the role of a black father. Mm -hmm. And these kids who grew up with our fathers need to know that fathers are great. Fathers are essential. Uh, fathers are the, should be the head of the household and should govern accordingly. And they need to see stories that reflect that, whether they have a father in their life or not, because I grew up without a father but I had Heathcliff Hustable and I had James Evans as role models, along with a couple of coaches that came in my life that kind of showed me what a real father looked like. Amen to that. Boy, you had two strong ones right there. <laughs> I, I don't know. That balance was pretty different, though, because they, they totally was different, weren't they? <laughs> right, right. And, and, and I'm talking about the characters. I ain't talking about the actual guy, but I'm talking about the characters. No, no, I know. I know. <laughs> you know, but you know I think you brothers, man, and I know both of you very well. And of course, you you answered my my first question before I could even ask you your, your inspiration behind it. We've had some very um, I'll, I'll say productive labs these past several weeks because we've gotten to some of the education on the topic. And what I want to ask my 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 first question I want to ask y'all is this, man. I know both of you brothers. I know both of y'all day jobs. Now, here I am trying to work on a book, you know, about my, you know, I, I, want, I want my book to be about my faith and my formation as a man and so forth. But I don't just never have no time. I don't ever have time. I have so many thoughts. 
So for those brothers that are there, not even young brothers, brothers like me, I'm being sober here. I want y'all to just kind of logistically educate us. Because again, David, I, I know your job. You, you, you and Molly have got to be two of the busiest brothers I know. And, and David, then you started the, the 5K and just all of this. So logistically, how do you split in time? Where, where are you taking those? How do you put this together in order to be able to put your thoughts down on paper um, you know, is there, you wake up in the morning and say, hey, this is what I dreamed about. Let me jot this down or, or at night when there's some peace. How do you put that together logistically, man, to get to a point where you're, you're able to put in a book? I want, I want us brothers to, to learn about that. David, let's start with you, man. Okay. Well, I will say this, and, and, and I treat this like anything that's very important to me, like a marriage. Uh, when people always ask me about a marriage, I say a marriage is not just about love. It's about commitment and sacrifice. And so when I decided to do a book, and I'm not a person who write a lot of books. I've only wrote, written two books. One is called I'm a Father, and one is called I'm a Mother. And I partnered with Karen Greer with CBS News to do the I'm a Mother because I wanted to give voice uh, a, a platform for these ladies and these fathers to have a voice uh, to be heard. And so it's commitment to sacrifice. Anytime you dive into any project that is going to be successful, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Hmm. Less time with your kids, less time with your wife, uh, late hours. You're going to have to do that. And that's that's pretty much what happened with me. I was committed. Uh, there was a cause. Uh, my motive is, is, is very similar to Mauli. We're very similar. We're both married to two beautiful queens. We both have two sons. We, our, both our birthdays are in April. You know, there's a, there's a lot, there's a synergy there. But it, for me, it was really about commitment and sacrifice. And once you look at that blank page, you got to be committed to the process because mm. you know this is not the pad your pocket. Like you said, we got day job. We got this. Right. This is to make an impact. If you're just doing something not making an impact on others, in my opinion, uh, it's, it's not worth completing. How long did it take you to navigate that process? So my, my book is different than, and I haven't seen Mauli. I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait to help you promote that. My book is different because I had to put together a bunch of interviews. And so finding the people, you know, how do you get to a Morgan Freeman? Well, I, I went through his daughter. You know, how do you get to a big boy? How do you get to Dominique? Dominique, well, because I had to go to a Hawks game and sit down to get a picture with wow. him. Wow. Look. And so, it, you know, I had to travel to California to meet some brothers there. Uh, I had to really be committed to saying I want to do this because I was so, for lack of a better word, I was so freaking pissed off about what, how the media was portraying black men that I no longer wanted to turn on the TV or listen to the radio without me doing something and, and sharing a different part of it. And since then... I've met some wonderful organizations like Cool Dad mm -hmm. Rock, I'm a Father First, a lot of people, Mauli, you know, Black Man, like, a lot of people that are going in the same direction. Right. Because it can't be just one person. Um, it has to be a group, a group with power. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. That's that's powerful. Now, 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 Miss Mauli, you know, we we've heard your motivation behind it, but we've never really unpacked. The logistics, man, like, you know, how long did it take? Like, what, what, how did you steal away moments for that, man? I, I mean, I, yeah. I definitely probably know your life a little bit more than David's, but I, I am clueless how you would have pulled it off, but you did. Now, I, I, man, I agree with David in terms of it's about a discipline. It took me, honestly, four years to, and, and what I had to do, and this is what I encourage, I think, in all aspects of our life where we want to grow. I wanted to grow as a writer. I wanted to grow as a contributor. We have to have accountability partners and we have to reach the people who care about us and care about the things that we produce and say, will you help me? And so, man, I, I, I got a group of brothers that I sent a text to um, on my birthday. I think mm. I was... Uh, it was on my, when I was turning 51. So I had, I had written, um, and I had gotten to a place where I was a little frustrated 
because I just, you know, you start writing and you go in one direction, you put it down because something happens and, right. and then you pick it back up and you're like, man, what was I thinking, you know? And so one of the things is to try to carve out some consistent writing time on a daily basis, even if it is, and I can't wait to get back to it right now. I'm in like um, organizing mode to launch the book. And I want to just get this launched so I can go back because there's so many other things that I've been learning from. You know, I, I got about two or three other books in my head right now that I feel like could be helpful and, and useful, you know, because I see this work in the writing standpoint as a way to build our movement. For me, mm -hmm. you know, the firm, the family, it's all about how do we build um, our movement towards liberation, towards being, you know, a, a free, self-determined people again. And so um, I sent the text. I asked brothers, hit me up, you know, make challenge me on, ask me every day, did I did you do your writing today? Mm. Um, and I, I asked them to, to hit me. So I started doing that because I wanted to close this, I needed to finish the book. And so um, I'm grinding on that. I'm getting these text messages. I'm carving out the time in the morning. And that's, that was the best time was to get up early, um, do my little workout and then sit down with, you know, some water and write. And, um, gotcha. and even if it was just for 30 minutes, just write something. And, um, and then go back and what, what my, you know, one of my, um, elders told me was that you write one day, then you go back, you reread what you wrote, but don't edit it and just keep writing so that you can kind of, it's almost like, mm -hmm. um, a hip hop artist, you know, when they're in the booth and they spit, then they ask the, you know, they say, play it back. Then they pick up from where they went and then they spit some more and they build a song. You know, I've watched them do it now with these young creators. And so that's, that was my process was building. And I know it's different uh, for, for everyone, but with, with schedules like ours, I think you have to block time. Um, mm -hmm. And then the weekends were real good, you know, like a Saturday morning and then a Sunday afternoon, you know, you try to really get out and, uh, gotcha. and, and, and then send, you know, then give your stuff for review, get it back and try to clean it up and, um, and make sure that people understand what you're, what you try, what you're trying to say. So it's, it, it was a, it was a journey. It made me, you know, they talk about certain things It is not for the attainment of the thing. It's the person you become in creating it, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like it helped me become more, more disciplined, more focused, and um, more thoughtful. And so um, I, that's why I want to get back to the process and, and get going. Right. We'll do some more, you know, do some more writing. Yeah, and, and I, you sound like an artist, man. You sound like an artist with a paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. I, I, think, I think that that's a, that's a good point, man. I think that that's actually, you know, I've I've been fortunate that I've kind of watched Maui go through this matriculation of of getting to the point of the end of his book, which even when he got to the end of it, it, it he actually wound up still adding to it. Yep. Um, you know, where he thought he was like, he I remember you hitting me specifically. He was like, dog, I'm done with it. I got I got it finished. Boom. And then, you know, we kind of read through it. And then he hit me back and he's like, I think I need this something else. I need that. Yeah. To add to it. I'm like, well, can you do that at this point? <laughs> and, and, and he did, you know. So I think yeah. that's, that's, that, that's that art, you know, that's that piece, that, that's the art of it, you know, where you, where you see, I, my daughter is an artist and I know when she is painting and to me, it looks good. But in her mind, no, I need to, you know, I need the shading this way. I need this this way. So, um, were you going to say I, something else? I was just saying, and, and, and the, 
the tripped out part about it was, was that I had sent it out for review by some of my comrades because, because the book is about organizing, I was really reaching to scholar activists, you know, folks who have organized and done work. Um, and so Gray Carr from Howard, when he got it, he gives man, he he writes me back and he, you all people who know Greg, man, this dude is a machine of um of a thinker. I mean, this this dude is like he's one of I humbly believe one of the most, you know, profound thinkers of of our generation. And easily. Yeah, he he's a very, very deep thinker. He mm -hmm. he's he's a genius, right? And so mm -hmm. When he hit me back, it was like a, a whole bunch of love. And at the very end, he says, hey, but in light of what happened in Georgia and this insurrection thing, brother, I feel like you got to add, uh, you know, that chapter in. And, and it really, it was so on point um, in terms of adding that piece. Even because we have a study guide with it, my sister, um, my god sister Tashia Moja, she and uh, uh, sister um, Io, who are um, educators, did the did the study guide. So I send them that last chapter. Say, hey, I need y'all to to do uh, the to finish the study guide for for this part, and they were like, man, I thought it was done, but. I'm really glad you added this last section because it 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 addresses and kind of wraps it up in a way that is um you know I guess tighter or whatever. And so I think as writers and as artists and as as you know from an activist standpoint, I think we have to just remain open to to hearing from people who you know we know want the best product possible and they 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 feel your spirit and they like okay let's do this think about mm -hmm. this and mike mm -hmm. samanga has been that for me um he's been incredible in that way just encouraging me stretching me and pushing me in ways that i was you know you doubt yourself there's mm -hmm. there's always doubt that comes in even when you're writing about something that you love and care about deep yeah, and I, th I think that, um, you know, as it relates to your book particularly, um, it, lead, it lends itself to, to continuation, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a continuation of thought and it's a continuation of what's going on in our society. Um, what I want to ask you guys, though, is really about our young folks. We have our young folks, and I know, David, I haven't had an opportunity to look at it your book yet, but I know it's based off of what we hear. It's, it's impactful. Um, but in terms of touching our young folks, you guys have done a great job in in these these pieces of making it very um, um, applicable to their daily lives, right? And so in doing so, that makes them want to read, right? It, may, it makes makes them say, you know, oh, let me take it out. And then that in itself is what helps to change the paradigm of what what they're used to, right? Um, meaning, you know, you, you, David, you talked about uh, kids not necessarily having a father figure, but if they're able to read about um, what that, that picture can look like and, and it makes sense to them, then they can change, you know, kind of how they're moving forward. Um, or at least have an idea about that. So talk to us about um, that piece of what makes it impactful for young folks to want to, one, change, but then two, also maybe they want to delve into that work themselves. I mean, what's going to be that, that thing that you think would be impactful for them? And I'll start with you, baby. So when, when, when I wrote the I'm a Father uh, book, and it's I'm a Father Celebrating African American Fathers, I did that in the late 80s. And this book is still relevant today because we're still talking about fatherhood. And, and what made it popular was Ebony Magazine did a story on me and the book. 
uh, several years ago. Uh, what I think worked with young people, they got a chance to see young people putting their expression on paper. We have people as young as five years old writing about their father and mm. children as young as five and children as young as 75. And so, you know, telling the story about their father. Also, each page is a different story celebrating a father. So it's an easy, quick read. And, you know, when I was an educator in the 80s, I, I found that a lot of uh, our young boys were struggling reading unless they was reading something that was very interesting to them. Whether it was a basketball star, superhero, they would read more into that. And so when you got a book, you know, I wanted to make it as simple as possible. One page is about Dominique Wilkins' relationship with his kids. One page is about Big Boy from Outcast with his kids. Just one page. If I can get you to sit down for one setting, it should be so intriguing that it's going to make you turn the page for the next. And sometimes you have to meet people where they are. Man, that's, that's it. That's it, man. Um, the practical, you know, I, man, I think of, um, you know, ta Coates, who I think is, you know, the greatest writer of our generation. You know, I think he is our, our James Baldwin, you know, um, you know, he is phenomenal, just, just incredible with, with his words and, um, you know, just a special, special brother, a real, a real gift, um, to, to, to us liter, you know, in terms of, uh, a literary gift, you know, uh, and I'm clear, I wasn't, this was not a writing competition, right? This was just me trying to write something very functional for, um, to reach young brothers and and sisters, but but particularly to reach young people in a way through storytelling. So I was intentional about trying to start each chapter with a story, a story that um, would draw them in. You know, I I talked about in one chapter where I met a young woman who had been shot with a shotgun. You know, like. Hopefully that'll like, oh, what, what was that about? You know, sure. um, you know, I talked about the um, the attack uh, against Messiah Young and Tania Pilgrim by the Atlanta police office. And I talk about him starting, you know, what would what why would a young brother right at, at Morehouse who 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 wears ascots and wants to be a fashion icon have to say i'm not going to die tonight right like like so i was trying to get them to think you know and and, and it it so much of your writing i think is your life experience and it always comes into it and i remember a video of tupac one of my favorite um, art, right, artists, writers, poets, revolutionaries, um, martyrs, and, and, and Tupac is being, he was being deposed. And in the deposition, they were really trying to, to lure him in because they were trying to blame him for a police shooting that happened. They were trying to say, well, this police shooting happened because of your lyrics. And so he was being sued for a police shooting and um and so he ends up writing and uh, oh excuse me speaking and and they asked him a question they say well what were you trying to do with your with, with you know with your music and then he was like get people to think and i thought that was just profound and and that's what my hope is is that you know this humble you know, I, and, and I'm like you, David, I kept, I kept mine, like you did, single page, I kept it short, you know, in, in total, it's a, it's an 106 page, that's with everything, acknowledgments, all of that, 
So I was like, you know, that Jawanza Kanjufu type formula, you know what I'm saying? Them little, that Naeem Akbar joint, them little short <laughs> joints, you know? So that they, I ain't want them looking at it and saying like, nah, I ain't picking this joint up. You know, it's something that you they could potentially read in an evening, you know, within, yeah. a, four, you know, for a few hours. So I think, you know, being a, a functional, you know, I, I try to be a functional writer to some degree. And I, not that other writings are functional, because obviously when you're moved by someone, you, it, it serves a very important purpose. It's art. Um, and so that's, that's how I approached it. it, it um, while it's functional, I would say that it's also providing a ton of imagery that draws people. And I think that that's the key. Like when you talk about ta Coates, it as you talk about him being very good with, you know, his words, it's really a matter of the, the level of imagery that he puts into those, oh. those writings that makes you in that, in that space. Um, you know, me personally having went to Howard, a lot of that, as he talked about, you know, oh. Howard campus, I'm, I'm living it as I'm reading it, right? And I know that other people, you know, had those same experiences. So um, I think that one of the things that, that I would love to be able to make sure that it, our, our young folks out there have a level of understanding of is, as you write, being very comfortable with um, working your words to to show your images, right? However that is, because that's that's the piece I think that keeps people locked in to, to want to listen to what they're reading. You hear what I'm saying? Listen to what you're reading. Because as you're reading it, you're listening to it in your head. Yeah. So I, I think that that's the biggest piece that we want to encourage people as they're writing whatever, you know, whether that's poetry, a book, uh, uh, a screenplay, whatever. Make sure exactly. that you are getting really tight with your your words so that you can show your imagery. And that's going to be a lot of people. Joe, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I, I think that's a great segue, Marty, with what you just said. I, um, You know, I think about our youth. And on, on Saturday mornings, as y'all know, you know, I'm with Gary Davis, who, who I, I text him to see if he can hop on to promote his book as well. Um, <laughs> He has, uh, he has a Monday standing commitment, so he might not be able to jump on. But on Saturday mornings, man, we're in a room full of young brothers. And, you know, we're mentoring and we're trying to talk and create a space. And it's, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, when I was in high school, they used to, you know, Barker, man, he's a nerd. He's a nerd. And I just used to look around like, my bad, is that a bad thing? Like, I'm, I'm going to college on scholarship. Bad, am, I, am I wrong for that? And when I sit on that Saturday morning, I hear all these brothers who just want to be creative and in a space where they're doing things, but then all their peers around them and nothing against rap music, nothing. Molly, you're, you're creating a whole, whole album that is the, the voice of our youth, but it's more than just rap music. And these young brothers in that room, and I can see the spark in their eye. They want to say something. Some of these brothers might be vision boarding. Some of them might be trying to create code, uh, create apps. Some of them poetry. But they're so reluctant to, to say things. And, and I think about the Will Packers and the Rob Hardys and the Dave Shanks. You know, my, my brother's that I saw that struggle. You know, people might look at Will Packer now like, oh, man, Will, you know, that, uh, man, let me tell you, y'all seen the struggle with Will Packer. 20-plus years, Rob Hardy didn't just start producing TV overnight. And I just want to ask you, how do we create a space where these young men can be confident and, hey, this is what I want to do. And I saw David Manuel do that. And I want to ask him some questions because that's the path I want to go. How do we as black men do a better job as far as creating spaces where they can investigate their creativity and, and, and not be judged for thinking outside the box because, quite frankly, that's what we need to be doing. That's how the, the Black Panther Party was created, thinking outside the box, and that's 10-point platform. All of our greatness comes from outside the box thinking. 
So, David, I wanted to ask you and, and, and Molly, how do we do a better job as black men to create spaces where they can be the, their creative selves? Well, you know, you have so many different groups, so many different organizations that are providing, quote unquote, uh, areas for people to be expressive. But I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to be straight up honest with you. The first time I came to uh, Black Man Lab, one of the reasons why I was so excited about it, it was one thing to see a bunch of brothers, you know, pouring into the lives of a bunch of young, young kings. That was great. I've seen that before. But how it started off was really what sold me and said, this is a turning point for so many others that are trying to do this across the United States. When Mauli opened the invitation and said, I know this has been a crazy week for many of us. If you need a hug right now, come on, line up. Yes. And, 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 you know, everybody tried to be all hard. Everybody tried to be all hard. I don't need something to go. But there was one brother that raised his hand and said he needed a hug. And it was a line of brothers that wrapped around the room and lined up to hug that brother. We don't even know what we're going through as black men or as young men. And right. to see that, you mm -hmm. open up, it was like the key to the lock. You opened mm -hmm. up all the creativity, all the openness because of how you started. That should be the statue of how we start organization and create a safe space. We got to make people wow. feel welcome and comfortable. And the Black Man Lab mm -hmm. did that. It inspired me to say, moving forward, I got to use that. Because you don't know how people are coming into that door. You're thankful that they came in that door, but you don't know yeah. what they had to cross over to get there. And that's the first thing mm -hmm. that was stressed. How you doing emotionally, mentally? We see you physically, but how you really doing? And to me, that should be the yeah. start point of any organization that's creating a safe space. Because this, I this love thing it. called world, this thing called life, it ain't no joke. Right, right. Thank you, bro. That's, that's powerful, man. And that is David, David is David is so humble, man. He doesn't even mention. So what he does on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, pre-COVID, is you know, he, he runs Porter Sanford and exactly. they have programming for young people there all the time. You know, they got camps, they got stuff where and, and, and I think it's those kinds of opportunities, you know, in school, you know, I was really, man, one of the, some of the best time that I have spent with Jaina has been, and Jaina being my wife, has been us doing the um, Black History Month play together at Renfro Middle School in Decatur, where, you know, we write and produce it, and then we bring these young people and they do monologues and they they act and they they do their roles. And these are young people who other people in that school building had written off. Had, had they they didn't see value in them. And so it's about creating spaces and opportunities that are safe for our young people to be expressive. So much I wrote, I wrote. I have one other book, and, and it hasn't been in publication in a long time. But it was a it was po a group of um, of poems, and the title of it was "Black Men Ain't Supposed to Cry," and mm. that that's it, man. You know, that's our our reality. You know, is that we're not supposed to cry, and, and we're supposed to suppress our emotions and and not tell our story and our truth and, right. and bear our heart. And even in this book, there's a, you know, with, you know, we, the, we need you book, man, there, there are spaces where I have to be honest. When, when Kahari was out there in the middle of the protest on May 29th, as things began to escalate and police cars set on fire, like, yeah, I'm, I am, I believe, I pray that I'm a fearless revolutionary, but I was scared. And I had to say that I was scared for my son. I was scared for our family. I was scared for other young people. And that's not, you know, 
that's not the thing that that people look for you to say you know what leader says you know hey i was afraid you know mm-hmm. but but we got to be honest and i think we when we're honest we invite honesty into the conversation with our young people and we have to just be as intentional as possible even with this black man lab young creators entrepreneurs and innovators project that we're doing it's amazing how the young people are just like feeling so um they communicate this sense of free of freedom (laughs) of freedom you know like we're not telling them what to say, what to think, what to do. We gave them the book. We read it. We discussed it with them. And mm-hmm. then we say, go create. Does any of this apply to you in any kind of way? And create and, and do it to your peers, not to yeah. satisfy us. That's the thing. Don't, don't write to us. You know, we are the converted, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> write to the folks that need your young peers who are debating whether they should put a gun to their head or somebody else's. Reach mm. them with mm. your work. And mm. when you do that, then we've created a space that's not just safe for those that are in it, but that space radiates out, right? And it's creating safety all throughout our community. Absolutely. And that's yes. what um that's that's what our objective has to be. And that's what I'm I'm man committed to you know, for, for the remainder of my days is to yeah. just pour into these young people and give them a chance to do, you know, to figure it out and help them. And, yeah. and Molly, I've, I've known you not quite as long as Marty, but I've known you for a long time, brother. And since I've known you, that's, that's exactly what you've been doing. I want to double back to David because Molly, you hit the nail on the head. He, He's over there being all modest, but I know what the Port of Sanford Center does. And I, I know the greatness of what they offer a community. So, David, I just want to also give you a platform, man. I know we've been in a COVID environment and, and things may have been curved, but talk to us a little bit about some of the creative spaces that exist and existed at the uh, Port of Sanford Center. Well, we're, we're excited because we just ordered, and I think the last day was last week, um, all new state-of-the-art equipment. You know, it's one thing to say we are state-of-the-art facility, and that's always been in our byline, but you know, <laughs> when it comes to production equipment, you got to upgrade every six months or you're not state-of-the-art. But I, I'm here to say, uh, and, and Maoli and anybody else that's listening that want to bring an event there, uh, the sound system, the speakers, all that is just brand new. We're excited about it. And we're also excited that next week we're going to start, you're going to start seeing the tractors in. We're building an outdoor amphitheater. So we're going to have entertainment wow. in the building as well as under the stars. And I'm really excited. Wow. Because the amphitheater couldn't, I've been trying to get the amphitheater for the last five years and now it's here. What better time than now when we're in a COVID-19 yeah. environment We need to be doing more things outdoor. So to have that option of indoor and outdoor, uh, we're going to set a whole new tone for Rainbow Drive and Keller Road and what that looks like and feel like when it comes to arts and culture. So I'm excited about that. We have the classrooms. We have the black box. You know, the black box started off uh, David Bozeman uh, annual. uh, (laughs) I remember. (laughs) They they, they blew it out. They blew it out. but the memories will last forever because hey. they they created a different vibe to where I started yeah. calling it the black box sound stage after uh, uh, Mauli and them came in there and just took over. <laughs> and, and, hey. and not only that, then his son had a birthday party over there, and I looked on the balcony and they were carrying people through the crowd, you know. <laughs> 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 And, and so, you know, I love arts, it. Arts about anything that's entertainment. I want to display it. I want to put it on stage. I never say no to anything that's creative. I always figure out how we can do that under the rules of the government, but right. also keep that creativity and that flowness. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, oh, man, that's that yeah. exciting. And, and, and Molly and Marty, it sounds like we're gonna have to um, do a special broadcast out there one of these days, brothers. Absolutely. Oh, sure. And look, I, I, I want 
And I'm really disappointed that today Jared isn't on and Maurice <laughs> isn't on because I wanted, want y'all to be clear that Porter Sanford, the, the, the brother who the facility is named after, mm -hmm. was a good member of the greatest fraternity, <laughs> Kappa Alpha fraternity, and of Atlanta alumni. So I'm getting some text messages from, from my Kappa brother saying, look, you better make sure they know who Porter Sanford was now. So, so I want to just put it all out there mm -hmm. and uh, let that resonate and ring out. You know what? We're gonna we're gonna respect the greatness of of, of Capital, man. I, I salute you, brothers. I never never got an issue. I, I coach actually with Sandy um, at, at um, Sandtown for several years. He coached my son. Wow. I coached his. Another great new man. I don't know how I keep running all these great Capital men, hey, but man. You know, I guess that's down to show that they exist. And I'm gonna tell you this. Today is Bobby Sanford's birthday, so it's kind of ironic oh. to celebrate this. So today wow. is Bobby Sanford's birthday, and I'm honored. I'm honored to be the director over at Porter Sanford. I learned so much about him throughout the years. He was also a founding member of the 100 Black Men of DeKalb County. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he, he was a brother that really invested his time, his money. Uh, Sanford Realtor right there off of, what is that, Wesley Chapel or Panola, whichever one. Uh, That's right. Th th and then Bobby has taken that torch, and she has been huge and instrumental in a lot of the planning that's going on in DeKalb County. And so, yes. uh, beautiful family. They've had some challenges, but I mean, uh, just a beautiful, strong family that's committed to the community. I've got to, I've got to wish her a happy birthday. That's okay. a, that's, okay. yeah. Very classic, very classy queen. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we, you guys touched on, um, you know, we talked about creative spaces, right? And, and we talk about um, allowing, you know, for our, our kids, our, our young folks to, to see their greatness. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen with the um, Young Innovators, Creators, and Entrepreneurs Project Black Man Lab is that when when the opportunity is there for our young folks to express themselves openly, um, we see the greatness that's in them. Um, I think by, by nature, uh, we as black folk have uh, uh, innate ability to be great when allowed, right? And that's because of years and years of having to make do um, with less, um, years and years of being suppressed and oppressed, um, when the opportunity has presented itself, greatness shows. And we, we're seeing that with this project that we have. Um, David, I'm sure you've seen it many a times in your spaces. Uh, and we have to work hard to keep these kinds of spaces open for, for, our, for our young folks. Um, so, David, I, I really want to um, look move forward as as things begin to open up, look for opportunities for Black Man Lab to come into Port of Sanford and, and whether it's work with you all or do some projects within there, um, especially on these creative topics that we're talking about right now. Um, great thing about writing is, is that that gives an opportunity for these young folks to express themselves and really delve into whatever their greatness might want to be. You know, if, it, if that's going into some professional field, if that's actually becoming a writer, if that's becoming a musician, whatever the yeah, case, yeah. it gives those opportunities. So um, I want us to look to do that moving forward. Um, I, look for, I look forward to that. Also an ad production too. Uh, with all this equipment and we have tech people, let's teach these young people how to be behind the camera. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of money behind the camera. Yep. Yeah, we're, we're actually seeing that within the project uh, that we're doing is that um, our peer mentors, we have some great peer mentors that are simply pouring out to these young folks. I mean, I, it's taking their time to show them things that they would, information that they wouldn't even get in school, you know. Um, David, we had, we, had we, had Shannon, we had Shannon McCullum yesterday out there taking, taking photos with them. Um, hooking them up. Then we had 
Antonio Moses from Ashanti Films. I know he debuted, I think, his um, documentary on human sex trafficking at Porter Sanford. Right, right. So, you know, these are all, you know, how the, the, the universe is small mm -hmm. as it relates to the, the, those that are, you know, doing doing this work. So, yeah, right. that I, I agree 100% with Marty with they're getting behind these cameras and uh, falling in love with with trying to capture and tell the story from from that perspective. The other thing, and I'll be quiet after this, is that I think what writing requires us to do is stop and think. And mm -hmm. and as an activist, I had to really think, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm moving and running and and, and doing my thing. And uh, this is one of our young our young brothers. Come duck your head in here, Martin. This is this one of our. Our young brothers, hey, you two doing? of them. This is uh, Sway and T. These these are our, our, our young brothers from the project. What's um, up, brothers? So they What's up, man? they came through the they came through the office to drop in. But I think the writing makes us stop and think. And I think there's um, my ancestors when I think of Conrad Worrell and Anderson Thompson and Asa Hilliard, um, Charcy McIntyre, they were scholar activists. Mm -hmm. So they wrote, organized, and thought. And I think that we need more of the thinking part. You know, the activism obviously is critical because we see how it impacted the direction of this country this summer. But the mm -hmm. thinking and writing and the, and the thinking as a result of sitting down and writing is another aspect that I think is, uh, you know, strong. Well, that's that's the next level, right? That's when we talk about activism, it's, it, does, it does a couple of things. The writing, number one, it documents what's going on, but then also it gives opportunity to look forward. Because we start thinking, and as you think and put pen to paper, you're thinking about what the next step is. You know, we're thinking about moving forward. It's funny that was that Molly. That was M Martin that came in there. Yeah, it's Martin and T, man. They, okay, they, they, they came in the spot. They did, did, he, uh, hey, hey, you know, you talked about you talked about that piece of um, our young folks being able to impact, impact those around them. Did he bring some young folks yesterday? Yeah, uh, man. See, he, that's how. That's how T got in the mix, and he brought some of his artists yesterday as well. And, yeah. and uh, you know, we just got to keep reaching. And if it if it's good, you know, it's like I'm gonna tell you, you know, hey man, I went to a a, a a crazy party last night, man. Next time they do it, you should come. And so it's it's that, but it's a sure. it's a cultural yeah. it's a cultural revolutionary party. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Brothers, look, we are we are pushing up against the clock. Um, I want to make sure that we we have some time to talk about um, um, our our uh, rituals and discipline, um, habits, rituals, and disciplines, which we talk about every week. We always want our panelists to talk about their daily habits, rituals, and disciplines, so that our folks that are listening in may find a nugget within there that they want to implement into their daily habits, rituals, and disciplines if they have any. And sometimes people don't have any. So, you know, hopefully we can give them a little something, um, especially as it relates to our young folks. So um, with that, Molly, I'm going to start with you first. I know yours, but I want you to be able to, to talk to the audience about your habits, rituals, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis. And David, if you could wrap it up as well. Man, so so here here's what's deep in terms of how we learn from our children and from this younger generation. We go over to uh, this the studio about two weeks ago. Uh, I think it's Bravo Ocean, one of the studios that we we, we used for um, some of the recording. So while they're in the booth doing what they're doing, I'm outside and I see um, a video playing, and I recognize the guy. I forget his name, but he used to be a monk. He has a book, um, you know, about about being a monk. But he's just all into, you know, deeper self awareness, meditation, and and just manifesting through through your thoughts. 
And as I watched it, he has Big Sean on with him, right? And so I was like, because I was thinking, I'm like, this is kind of weird to be at a music studio and to see this dude, but then I see, I realize it's Big Sean and they're, they're showing, and Big Sean is just talking about, from the, a rapper from Detroit, um, just talking about his journey and, and what he does to, you know, awaken himself spiritually and his consciousness. It's a very, very good, about 50 minute uh, on YouTube, you can find it. Uh, it's called, I think, Living on Purpose is the name of this, this brother's um, podcast. And mm -hmm. so, man, I, I'm checking it out. And one of the things that he said that I, I just adopted this morning, that's what's leading into this, is that he said he had this beautiful house in Beverly Hills. His next door neighbor or one of his neighbors was Vanna White. You know, <laughs> so he was he had made it right. But he said he was having difficulty getting up out of bed. Right. And so he said he realized through working with um, different people spiritually that it's he had to move out of the space of what I got to do and move into a space of what I get to do. Mm -hmm. So today I wrote my um, my what I get to do list. Right. It's not what I got to do list. It's what I get to do because I'm blessed to be able to take a breath, to wake up this morning. And he talked about, he talked about Nipsey Hussle. He's like, man, Nipsey gone, you know? And so it just changed it to even, to even write out your list of what you get to do, starts you in this space of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that's, that's where I wanted to start today. So now I have my, not my to-do list. It is what I, my get to do list, what I get to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I started out this morning with that. I get up, I do my, um, my workout. Um, I, I, Joe, I couldn't do my five miles, man. So I did four. Um, hey, good and, work. And then, and then I'm writing, I'm writing in a journal. So it's not, right. I'm just writing. I write, um, what I'm grateful for what I'm proud, what I'm proud of. And the last thing is um, what I know, right? What I know is going to happen today. And I do that and then I do some spiritual reading, um, you know, read in, in, in my different traditions. And then uh, I'm rolling, drinking me a, a glass of water and, and rolling. So that that's become my, my routine, I'm trying to lean on it even more because I, I am convinced more than ever that now is our time, right? I really deeply believe that. I've seen things line up. I've been in this movement for a long time, but I'm convinced that now is our time, that we our ancestors have been right. They planted the seeds, and now we just have to, you know, really push across the finish line and there was a time and then i'll be quiet that many of the people that i organized with as a young man would say we have to be okay knowing that we are not going to realize mm -hmm. certain things in our lifetime mm -hmm. All right and, and think let's just man yeah what those are some real folk, right? Those are some real people to, to, to acknowledge. Man, it may not happen in my lifetime, but that doesn't mean I'm not going right. to contribute. That doesn't mean that I'm going to just go try to just, you know, just pleasure myself. Instead, even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I'm going to contribute to it because I have to. And so I'm of the mindset but there are going to be some things that are realized in our lifetime, for real, for real. And we just got to recognize um, how close we are and, and press forward. So that leads to my habits, rituals, and disciplines and what motivates me. Yeah, and, and uh, a couple of things there, man. That, that I think first and foremost, that especially, especially now, 
um, they're waking up with gratitude um, and being being appreciative of all that you have, even the good, even the bad, right? Being there appreciative is, of all that you have. There, 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 there is that, right? Everything is every when we when we really get it, everything is shaping us for whatever whatever the Creator, and the Most High, and the ancestors want us to do, right? Yeah. It's even in the even man, I'm. I thought about, man, I wasn't, that didn't feel good. Ooh, that hurt. I look back now, man, it had to teach me forgiveness. Yeah. You know, this morning yeah. I was I was trying to exercise forgiveness. People who I know did things that that were intentionally, you know, harmful towards me and my practice and what I'm doing. But man, please. Mm. I'm I'm trying to operate in God's space. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I can't play with it. Yeah. That that's that's not it's not for us to control, right? That's not for that's not our business. Our business is to, to do the creator's work and, and be be grateful that we are here and we are able to do this work. So I hundred percent agree with that. Um and I also hundred percent agree that uh, some of some of this great work that is happening right now. You know, in our lifetime, we might not see the realization of it. What we will see is somebody taking the mantle to move it forward, right? I, you know, I, I, my, my big vision is that the day that I expire, whatever that day is, is that I know that some of this work that I've been a part of and that we've been a part of will be handed off to somebody else that can take it and take it to the next level and, and get this world to where it's supposed to be. I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, Brother David, how about you? Your habits, rituals, and disciplines. Okay, so I could easily say ditto to everything Mauli said because, <laughs> you know, he he knows what I'm about to say when it comes to being grateful. But before I even get that, I'm, I'm sort of mad at uh, David's Bozeman Law Firm because, Marty, they should have got you better Wi-Fi. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to work, work on them, brother. We're going to work on the Wi-Fi. That's that's me. That's me. I don't know why in my house it, it, it sometimes it's great, sometimes it, it kills my greatness. Now we, we David, we're, Black Man Lab going spot for that. We got you, brother. We'll figure it out. We got you. <laughs> I'm with you. I even got the upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I I will say this, and and I feel like I'm I'm picking back on uh, what my Uli said. Being grateful every morning, I can tell you every morning or almost every morning. I get on my new uh, stationary bike because the Alma Father 5K has now added biking. And I was in a car accident a couple years ago where I had to have knee surgery. So the pavement and running just ain't the ticket for me. And sometimes you have to go with plan B. So the biking is easy on my knees. I'm doing it. So I try to do that every morning. I even downloaded the Peloton app and, uh, and work out with them. You know, I drink a smoothie. But the real, real is every morning I wake up, and I'm serious. serious. I'm, I lay on my back for a few minutes, and I open my eyes like I'm truly surprised that I actually woke up. <laughs> I am truly surprised. I'm truly thankful. And some mornings I wake up with tears in my eyes because unless you've been through something, you don't know how special it is just to wake up. We take waking up for granted. We take it almost like, well, I'm, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and deal with these issues. No, you might not even wake up tomorrow. And so I embrace it and I lay in bed for a few seconds, you know, thanking God with so much energy, like it is my last time waking up and I want to make sure he hears it from me. Um, Sometimes our young people won't get that until they've had some life experiences. But if you can get that now, you know, and usually when you talk about something, you usually reach one or two people now and you reach a lot of people later. But if you can wake up every morning with that sense of gratitude, it doesn't matter what your ritual is. It doesn't matter if you drink coffee, work out, drink a smoothie or whatever. If you can wake up being thankful and grateful for the mere fact that you made it through the night, you can take on anything. These last three or four months, I have been surrounded by death. 
Uh, I'm a mentor uh, for LifeLink and Donate Life. So I talk to many people on a daily and weekly basis about where they are in terms of being on a transplant waiting list. Some of them will make it. Most of them will not make it because they won't get that life-saving organ in time. These last few months, I've experienced a lot of people who, who were still waiting. And, it's, and I had to even question myself, am I the man for this cause? Because every time I lose someone, I feel like it's deteriorating part of me. But it also gives me an appreciation on what I went through and, and what my role is and my purpose. So when I go to sleep at night, and then I see that sun shining through that curtain and that, that irritating bird at my window that wake me up. I'm looking at it like it's a conversation. It's not irritating because I, I got up. And that means I have an opportunity to deal with some junk, deal with some mess, deal with some positivity, make an impact on somebody's life. I got a chance to start it all over again. So I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for the freedom I have in my life. I'm grateful for the lessons I'm learning. I'm grateful for the true advice I get from people. Um, you know, there is no bad days. They're just learning days. And I, and, I, and I embrace it. So I can encourage that to the young people. Um, uh, be, be thankful. Be grateful. Uh, look at everything, the opportunity. Don't look at what other people are doing and feel like you don't measure up to them. Don't ever do that because you are right where you're supposed to be. And yeah. tomorrow you will have a chance to even move it forward. And that's how you have to look at it. Amen to that. He, he preached today. He <laughs> preached. Brother. I love it. Yeah. Now, this, David's testimony is so real, brother. When I, when I saw David in that, in the hospital, man, I think they had given David seven days to live. Five. Five, Five days to live, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, see, and, and, and to see him live his life on with such purpose. But prior to that, you know, I mean, David was has always been a good man. He's always, you know, he's been on this. Mm -hmm. But but since then, I do like um, steroids now, right? Man, it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He like you know, and and you know when you when you see your friend in the bed, man, and he's like, bro, I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm holding on and, and folk just around praying, you know, and then the miracle comes through with, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with, a, a transplant, mm -hmm. it, 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 it was, you know, just, so when he testifies, he's testifying from a space that few people have been well, and that, yeah. that's, that's a powerful, powerful testimony. You, yeah. you know, I remember about three years after uh, my transplant, and I was a uh, keynote speaker for uh, the NFL retirement players, and they asked me to speak. And, and during the speaking process, I was kind of giving my testimony, and mm -hmm. tears were just coming down. I was crying all through it, but I didn't stop. And I even paused a minute and, and told them, I said, those are not sad tears. Those are uncontrollable joy tears. I'm gonna Ooh. get this, I'm not gonna stop. I said, so don't get caught up in the tears and people handing me tissue and stuff like that. I look like uh, Michael Jordan with a crying me. <laughs> I was, I, I, I was I love it because when I started speaking, I started remembering the times where I'm hugging my sons, my two boys, saying goodbye to them. You mm. know, not being able when they said uh, parents day on the football field for this big game and my oldest son had to walk uh, – with his mom in my place. And, you know, they said, so I'm remembering all that. And I'm also remembering when the doctors are whispering with each other saying he might have three days, he might have four days. And then I remember laying there and having a conversation with God, letting him know, I'm not ready to go. I'm not ready to stop being a father. I'm not ready to stop being a community activist. I'm not ready to stop mm -hmm. making an impact. I say, but I'm so tired and in so much pain. If you say this is my time and I'm a person who never quit, I will surrender to you, only you. I say, but I'm not ready. And as soon as I sit that prayer, and guys, I do not kid you not. Speak now. Three or four minutes, I heard a loud noise outside my hospital room. Now, I had tubes in my nose and my mouth, 
and the nurse came in and I was irritating. I was like, what is that freaking noise? And she was like, Mr. Mannion, that's a helicopter with your surgeon and your liver. You're going to surgery tomorrow. You're going to live. So what do you do when you get a second chance on life? Well, whatever you're doing, you're going to do it like you're on steroids. And you're going to give God a grateful thank you all the way. So when I say I wake up in the morning grateful, I go to bed grateful. I'm, mm. I'm doing it. I'm driving with the, drop, with the drop top down because I want to get closer to God. That's why I bought that convertible. So, I love it. And it's, sweet. <laughs> it's a sweet convertible too, boy. <laughs> so I can listen to some Barry Manilow and start screaming. People might see me on Keller Road at 25 saying, that's a fool behind the wheel. No, nah, that ain't a fool. <laughs> that's, that's a miracle man who understands yes, his sir. And, uh, yes, sir. and some days I get tired of the work. Some days I think it's overwhelming for my sister. But then I look at brothers like Maule, and you got to surround yourself with some brothers that are doing something. I might be talking to three people about the importance of being an organ donation, but then I might look at social media and Maule is talking to 3,000 people at a rap. And so, you know, you, you want to have that mental competition with people who are doing good. How can mm-hmm. I do as good as he doing in terms of impacting the other? How can I surround myself with other brothers? We just lost a brother named Cornelius Stafford, who was a president of the 100 Black Men. Me and Maoli joined under his leadership. That's and, right. And he needed a kidney, uh, but he couldn't get one. He passed away. But this brother was a powerful speaker with a powerful platform. I do it for him. I do mm-hmm. it for uh, my donor family who lives in Scotts, Louisiana. I got to do it, man. I'm carrying the weight of everybody, and I carry it well. And I'm excited about it. So when I put on the suit, I'm trying to look my best for them. I'm trying to look my best for all those people who didn't make it, waiting on an organ donation. Man, I ain't got nothing but gratefulness in my heart. I say, man, brother. I say, I say, I say, yo. Start, start. Let me just hit you with that one. Because, woof, you, you, said, you said a word That's there, bro. The man, so listen, we, although we are over time, there was no way that that testimony could be stopped, man. So we appreciate you, baby. We appreciate the words of encouragement. We appreciate um, the work that you're doing, of course, as well. So, so thank you for that. Every week we close out um, in a tradition. And I want to bring Molly on uh, to go ahead and close this out, our, our tradition that we do every week. And this week is even more impactful with those words. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. thank you for that again. I got, I got these young brothers. They can come lock up with me, man. Man, do that. Come on over here. Lock in with them. I better put my mask on. Though. We respect. <laughs> you know, we gonna we gonna we gonna do this the the safe the COVID safe way. They in the office, but we socially distancing. We need you to book signing, brother. Yeah, let me. Uh, we need you to yeah, book signing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm a link in this chain. I have a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. I am a link in this chain. I'm a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. We are links in this chain. We are we are links in this chain. And we won't break here. And we won't break here. I say. I say brothers. Brothers, thank you again, man. Thank you again, and David, thank you again for sharing. Thank you for being part of the Black Man Lab, brother. We appreciate you. And uh, everybody will keep pushing, and we're going to keep loving and keep getting better. And uh, we'll see you next week. See you all next Uh, Monday. Appreciate you. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Peace, man.